formula mass and the mole. So when we looked at the periodic table and we could see that there was some information for each element, there's the atomic number on the top, the chemical symbol, which is the um, one or two letter combination that stands in for the name of the element, and on the bottom is the atomic mass. So the atomic mass tells us the average weight of um, all the naturally occurring isotopes. So we can just consider that to be the mass of that atom. A formula mass is the mass of um, a, an, a chemical compound. So it's the mass of a substance is the sum of the average atomic masses of all the atoms in the substance's formula. So to uh, calculate a formula mass, we would look at a chemical formula and find the mass of each atom in the formula and add them all together. Um, the formula mass of a covalent substance may be correctly referred to as a molecular mass. So when we, the formula mass and molecular mass are interchangeable to some extent, but really it's the, the proper use is to use formula mass for ionic compounds and uh, molecular mass for covalent compounds, although they are the same, you we calculate them the same way. Here's the formula mass for a compound that has three chlorine atoms, the green ones, and one carbon atom, the black one, and one hydrogen atom, which is the white one. So to find the mass of this compound, we would um, first figure out how many atoms there are, like we just did. Um, the, for the mass, or excuse me, the formula is down here, CHCl3. So if all we were given was the formula like this, then we'd see this has a carbon atom, and I'd look up the mass of carbon on the periodic table, and see this has a hydrogen atom, and look up the mass of hydrogen on the table, and see that this has three chlorine atoms, and look up the mass of chlorine on the table and multiply that by three. And then I add the mass of each different atom together, and that gives me the molecular mass. If this is a covalent compound, I call this the molecular mass. If this is an ionic compound, I call this the formula mass. But we find it the same way, which is by finding which elements are in the compound, how many of them there are, and how much they weigh. Here is another covalent compound. Um, we know that this compound is covalent because we can see that it's made of nonmetals and that these atoms are joined together in a very specific shape. So a molecule has a very specific shape, whereas um, ions usually come in cubes of repeating uh, particles, which we'll see in a minute. So we would just start this one the same way. Here's the chemical formula. If I were given just this picture and said, what is the molecular mass of this molecule? Well, I could do the same thing from this picture. I count the black ones. I know that black is carbon, or I'd be given that information in the question. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine carbons. And we'd count up the hydrogens. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Why are there only, oh, the eighth, the eighth one is back behind. We can't see it. There's, an, um, there's a third hydrogen atom on this carbon that's pointing back here, and we can't see it. So there are eight hydrogens. And then oxygens for the red ones. One, two, three, four. So we do the same thing. We find which elements there are, how many of each element there are, and what each element weighs add up the mass of each different element to give us the molecular mass if it's a covalent compound. So again, ionic compounds are not molecules, so um, we can't really say that they have a molecular mass. So what we're, what we're calculating when we look at ionic compounds, we calculate it the same way, but we call it the formula mass. So here's an example of an ionic compound. Ionic compounds, when they're solid, Ionic compounds are almost all always solid at room temperature. And so when we if we put it under a really powerful microscope like sodium chloride or magnesium bromide or 
lithium acetate or any different ionic compound that we can think of, it would look a bit like this, which is um, a positive if we imagine the green ones are positive, a positive ion in the middle surrounded by negative ions, and each negative ion is surrounded by positive ions. Um, maybe there are six that are surrounding them, like in this one, or maybe there are four or eight or a different number, but um, they all have this similar kind of repeating pattern. And when we think about the difference between this ionic compound here and the molecular compounds, covalent compounds that we were just looking at um, in the previous examples, we can see that this is actually the structure for sodium chloride. And sodium chloride, the formula down here, NaCl, this has just two um, atoms, one sodium and one chlorine. But I look at this structure up here, and there are, atom, there are far more than two atoms. So the idea is that when I look at an ionic compound, there's, sodium chloride is really just an illusion, that formula that I give it. There's no such thing as NaCl, like as if it's a molecule, like as if there are NaCl particles floating around. An ionic compound consists of a sodium surrounded by chlorides, and each chloride is surrounded by sodiums in a giant repeating structure that just goes on and on and repeats over and over again. So there's no such thing as NaCl. Really, this in this one right here, if I were to count all the green ones, it looks like I have 4 plus 5 plus 4, so 13, and 14. So this would be, this piece right here would really be Na13Cl14. Um, but when we look at a, a bigger structure and we take into account the fact that each of these atoms is really uh, at a corner, we can't count each of the atoms. So the atoms at the corners are kind of cut off. If we really um, took account of how many atoms there are in each repeating piece, there's one sodium and one chloride. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. So although NaCl is an illusion insofar as there is no such thing as a purple and a green one that are stuck together, just the two of them that float around. Um, NaCl is not an illusion in the fact that when I analyze this big structure and I say, well, how many sodium atoms are there per chloride atom? It's a one-to-one -one ratio. So this is a very important piece of information for this compound. Um, but since we're being really technical, I can't call it a molecular mass because this has no molecules. It just has a series of ions that are stuck together. When I, the, the two forms that ions exist in most often are this one right here, which is solid. And if I were to dissolve this, this is sodium chloride, which is just salt, the, the salt that we eat. If I put this in water, this salt crystal, what would happen is all of the purple and green particles would separate from each other. And they would no longer be a cube. They would kind of fill up the space of the water. They would kind of act like gas particles. They would, they would uh, fall into the glass of water and they would start to bounce around within that volume of water um, and move around within this, the entire space of it um, as, as if they were gas particles. So that, that's different than a molecule. So every single bond inside this cubic structure would be broken, and all of these separate particles would be separated, and they would each individually go on their way like little pool balls. If we look at a molecule, when I put this in a solvent, the atoms do not break apart. This atom and this atom and this atom and this atom do not separate from each other. This whole thing always stays together, even when it's in um, a, um, a solution. So let's imagine this is a molecule of sugar. If this is sugar when it's solid and it tastes sweet and then I put it in a glass of water and I stir it up, then the water tastes sweet because the sugar molecule is the same molecule. The atoms don't separate from each other and break apart in a molecule. That This molecule looks like this when it's solid and it tastes like solid sugar. And if I put it in water and stir it up, this molecule still looks like this. It still has the same shape, and it still, and that's why it tastes like sugar, is because it still has the same shape. 
So that's, that's one big difference between molecules, where all the atoms stick together even when it dissolves, and ions, where all of those particles would separate from each other if this were to be put in water. The mole is an amount, uh, an amount unit similar to familiar units like pair, dozen, gross, etc. So what that means is that um, uh, we can say that a pair equals two, and a dozen equals twelve, and a gross equals um, one hundred and forty-four. I think I think a gross is a dozen, dozen, but I can't I can't remember what that word means. But anyway, there's units where the word itself means a certain number of things. Dozen is a good example. A dozen means 12. A mole is also a word that means a certain number. A mole um, is a number of things, and it, it is um, like a dozen donuts. We use dozen when we're trying to talk about uh, things that we have tens of. So if I get a few dozen donuts, that's because I have 30 donuts. So it's, it's, we can talk about a dozen and talk about three of them because um, it, I, the total number I have is in the tens. But when I'm talking about um, atoms and molecules and the amount of particles that I have, when I have even a very tiny amount of stuff, I can't use dozens and we, we've kind of talked about this before we looked at, at a gram and we said that um, a, a proton weighs 1 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms and that's such an incredibly small number it's a zero with 27 zeros after the decimal point and then a one that number is really hard to write and so when we're trying to talk about the mass of a proton I don't want to write that number all the time so instead of instead of referring to the mass of a proton in kilograms, which, I, it, it, which is a really small number, I should refer to the mass of a proton in atomic mass units, which is a number where I can say a proton weighs one atomic mass unit. So when I'm trying to answer the question, how much does this number of protons weigh, instead of having to write a huge number with lots of digits and refer to it in units of kilograms, I'll say this number of protons weighs four atomic mass units because there's four protons. So the units, um, defining a unit to uh, talk about the size of the thing that we're talking about is sometimes really helpful. So the mole is the same way. When I'm trying to count how many atoms there are, that's a huge number. Um, so talking about a dozen of them doesn't really make sense. Even a gross. A gross is, let's say, 144 things. Even talking about how many grosses of atoms are there. Well, 144 is not a unit that's big enough to help us make the, the gigantic amount of stuff seem smaller. So we want to define a unit that is truly gigantic number. A dozen's only 12. A gross is only 144. A million is only a one with six zeros. The mole is a six with 23 zeros behind it. So a mole is a truly gigantic number of stuff. Instead of saying, well, how many atoms do I have? I have 6.022141797 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. Otherwise, I can say I have one mole. So a mole is just a way that we um, define a unit so that it becomes more useful to us when we're talking about truly gigantic numbers of things. I can say I have one mole. I have two moles. I have 10 moles. Instead of trying to write some number that is so huge like this with so many digits and uh, such a huge exponential factor in the scientific notation. So this particular number is called Avogadro's number. And I should go back to this and say, what is a mole exactly? A mole is the number of atoms in a sample of pure carbon-12 that weighs exactly 12 grams. So if we have carbon-12, remember, uh, the reason that they specify what kind of carbon is because we have different isotopes. So there's carbon-12 and carbon-13 and carbon-14. So if I had a, a sample of, of 
only carbon-12, just the isotope carbon-12, and it weighed exactly 12 grams. So exactly 12 grams of carbon-12, how many atoms would there be? There would be one mole of atoms, and one mole is this number right here. So this is the number of carbon atoms in 12 grams of carbon-12. That's where this number came from. And this number is called Avogadro's number. And we don't have to write all of these digits, even though this number is very precise because it has been measured to, what is this, eight, uh, eight spaces beyond the decimal point. So this is a very precise number, but it would be hard to write that over and over again, given the number of times we're going to have to use it, because we use Avogadro's number a lot. So it's often shortened to this, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. So, although one mole always equals this number, just like I can have a dozen donuts, or a dozen birthday cakes, or a dozen uh, bagels or something, right? You can always change what the, a dozen of what you're talking about. Um, the, do, the number 12 always stays the same. It, it's true of a mole as well. I can have a mole of carbon, or a mole of oxygen, or a mole of gold atoms, and one mole always equals this number of atoms. So it doesn't matter what substance I'm talking about. A dozen is a dozen. A mole is a mole. But a dozen birthday cakes has a different weight, a different mass, than a dozen donuts, because birthday cakes weigh more than donuts do. So the same is true of elements. We look at the periodic table and we can see how much each element weighs. Hydrogen weighs the least. Um, and as, we, as the atomic number goes up, the mass goes up. And, we get, and the, the atoms get heavier and heavier, get more and more massive. So if, I'm always have, if a mole is always a mole, and I'm always talking about the same number of things, then of course that mass always has to go up as the atoms get heavier and heavier. If I talk about one hydrogen atom, then it has a mass of one AMU, about. And if I talk about one helium atom, and it has a mass of about four AMU. Well, if I talk about one mole of hydrogen atoms, and then it has about a mass of one gram. And one mole of helium atoms has about a mass of four grams. So because a helium atom is four times heavier than a hydrogen atom, a mole of helium atoms is four times heavier than a mole of hydrogen atoms. That ratio stays the same. So we can see that in this picture here. Each amount of substance that you see is equal to one mole. This is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of zinc. This is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of carbon. This is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of magnesium one mole of copper, one mole of sulfur, one mole of silicon, one mole of lead, one mole of tin. So the mass that they or the the mass is different, right? We can see that they each have a different mass for the same amount of atoms, one mole in each case. They also occupy a different amount of space. They have a different volume, which speaks to their density. So um, the amount of space they take up and how much they weigh is different even though they're all representing one mole, the same number of atoms. Because the atoms themselves take up more space or less space, they're either bigger or smaller atoms, and they either weigh more or they weigh less. They're either big atoms or small atoms. The molar mass of an element is the mass in grams of one mole of that substance. So again, this, this is another uh, a unit of convenience. If we're, we, it's important to know how much an atom weighs. That is a useful piece of information. But I'm never just going to weigh one atom at a time because it would be really, really hard to just grab one atom at a time. I would need some really small tweezers to do that. Whenever I'm in the lab and I take a spoonful of stuff, a spoonful of chemical out of a bottle, a spoonful weighs you know, between one and five grams, let's say, one gram and five grams. So when I'm working with stuff in the lab, it's important to, to designate a unit that is 
within that range between one and five grams let's say or at least between one gram and a hundred grams which are the, the typical amounts of stuff that you might work with in a lab so we talk about how much one atom weighs one atom of hydrogen weighs one atomic mass unit well one mole of hydrogen atoms which is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd hydrogen atoms weighs one gram so one amu for one atom one gram for one mole it's a really useful uh conversion and that's why you might ask in the previous example well that's a weird way to define a mole 12 exactly 12 grams of exactly carbon 12 of pure carbon 12 that seems arbitrary the reason is so that we could make this conversion right here well, one atom of hydrogen weighs one AMU, and one gram of hydrogen, uh, or one mole of hydrogen weighs one gram. One atom of carbon-12 weighs 12 AMU. One mole of carbon-12 weighs, uh, weighs 12 grams. 12 AMU, 12 grams. So that's why they defined a mole that way so that it was so that this conversion was easier it was the the periodic table told us not only how much one atom of that substance weighs it tells us how much one mole of that substance weighs and a mole is is something is a quantity that we're far more likely to encounter when we're working with something in the lab and i have a spoon and i put a spoon in a chemical bottle and scoop some stuff out i probably have about a mole of it Okay, so here is the atomic mass of carbon, 12 AMU. The molar mass of carbon is 12 grams per mole. Mol uh, the atomic mass of hydrogen, 1.008. This is the number on the periodic table. How much does a mole of hydrogen weigh? One gram. So the number that you see on the periodic table has two meanings. It means how much one atom weighs of oxygen, and it means how much one mole of oxygen atoms weighs in grams. So again, more representations of one mole of stuff. This, uh, let's see, upper left. This is octanol. Octanol, this is one mole of octanol. You can see that's a lot of stuff and there, are a lot of liquid. So um, we're talking again about it. This is an issue of density. This looks like, uh, what do we have here? Sulfur. This one is S8, sulfur. So sulfur is um remember we talked about this before sulfur doesn't come one atom at a time sulfur comes eight atoms at a time so when i have one mole of sulfur molecules which is one molecule is s8 then that means that i actually have eight moles of sulfur atoms because each molecule has eight atoms in it so one mole of s8 weighs this much but if i look at sulfur on the periodic table, this is eight times the mass of one sulfur atom because there's eight atoms per molecule. Mercury iodide and methanol. So again, just one mole of each of these substances. The number of molecules in a single droplet of water is roughly 100 billion times greater than the number of people on Earth. So that's just to put in perspective the vast number of things that we're talking about because we ha can have at least some idea of how many people seven and a half billion people is because you know how many people live in your house and how many people live in your neighborhood and how many people live in your town and you have some sense of how many people live in your state maybe um, and maybe it's a small sense of how many people live in your country, but you know, that's, that's a gigantic number of people, right? And we're, they're saying that in one drop of water has a hundred billion times more particles than the number of people on earth. So that we're, we're dealing with huge numbers of things, just utterly unimaginable numbers of things 
when we're talking about how many particles there are in a sample of chemicals. And it also shows you how small a particle is. If, if I can fit 100 billion times more particles in this one tiny drop of water than there are people on Earth, then those particles are really, 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 really small. Okay, so why do we need to know how many particles there are or how much they weigh? We're talking about all of these different measurements and stuff. Well, um, when I'm trying to make a new material and I know that the material that I want to make has a ratio of iron to carbon of one to one, for example, then I need to know well, if I'm going to add iron atoms into my mixture and I'm going to add carbon atoms into my mixture and I need to add a one-to-one -one ratio, I need to know exactly how many atoms I'm adding. But I can't count that many things. That number is way too huge for me to count that many things when I'm trying to make anything. Because even in a drop of water, the number is way too big. So. Instead of, even though it's really important for me to know how many things there are, I can't count them. So how do I know how many things there are? Well, I can weigh them. Because I know if I have a certain amount of stuff, like 12 grams of carbon, I know that that gives me a certain number of carbon atoms. 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. One mole. So the reason that I have to know how much one mole weighs is because it's easy for me to weigh how much stuff I have. I can take my sample and put it on a balance and get the mass of that sample within seconds. And then I can use that mass and use this conversion factor to tell me how many things I have within, for, within a few more seconds. So within mere minutes, I can count how many particles there are in almost any sample that I'm going to generate in the lab physically trying to count that number of things would take more time than you have in the rest of the universe. So um, weighing thing, counting something by weighing it is a really, really useful thing. And this isn't so foreign. We, we do this at the grocery store all the time. They um, maybe rather than charging you by the grape or something, they'll weigh the amount of grapes and they charge you by the pound. Or, you know, a nail costs three cents per nail. Well, how many nails did you get? They're not going to count them when you go to the, to the front of the store. They're going to weigh them. And they know that each nail weighs 0 0.02 ounces. And they can do some math and they can count something by weighing it. So that's a really uh, useful, um, a useful conversion factor for us to count things, uh, count numbers of particles where the number is, is truly gigantic. So here's how we do those calculations. If I have um, a mass in grams, how much something weighs, I put it on a balance. Here's potassium. I put some potassium on the balance and it weighs 4.7 grams. How many potassium atoms do I have? Well, I have to look at the periodic table and figure out how much does potassium weigh. It weighs 39.10 grams per mole because the periodic table, when I look at potassium, So here is potassium on the periodic table. Um, it says down here the mass is 39.098. And remember, that number has two meanings. It tells me how much one atom of potassium weighs, if the units are AMU. And it tells me how much one mole of potassium atoms weighs, if the, gra if the units are grams. So. If I have 4.7 grams of potassium, how many potassium atoms do I have? Well, I know that it's 39.1, they round it up, 39.1 grams per mole. So do the math, 4.7 divided by 39.1, and I get 0 0.12 moles of potassium. All right, let's do another one. Um, if I have, now I'm going from moles to grams, if I'm trying to figure out how much a certain number of 
atoms is going to weigh. I have 9.2 times 10 to the minus 4 moles of argon, which remember is just a number. It's like saying I have 9.2 billion argon atoms. And I know that um, argon, according to the periodic table, argon, 39.948, they round it up. Argon is 39.95 grams per one mole. So if I have this many moles, which is less than one, right, this number is a small number, then I'm going to have this many grams less than 39.5. So it looks like it's about 100 times smaller. So, um, or th excuse me, 1,000 times smaller, this number, because this number is about 1,000th. One so um, the trick is when I'm doing any unit conversion, whatever number I'm given, this is just like it was in Chapter 2, I find the, the number and the unit that I'm given I draw my blank conversion factor, and whatever unit I have in the numerator up here, I put that unit in the denominator down here. And whatever unit I'm trying to get, I put that unit up here. Then I fill in the numbers according to the information I'm given, or the information that I get from the periodic table in this case, this number that's associated with argon. And then I do the math. I multiply by what's on top, I divide by what's on bottom. And then I get my number and I make sure that you cross your units out, your units cancel out. And then if your units cancel, you're left with this unit, which is grams, which is what I was trying to solve for. All right, let's try another one. Copper is commonly used to fabricate electrical wire. How many copper atoms are in five grams of copper wire? So remember we're given when we're when we have a problem like this, we have to take the information, the number and the unit that are given, and identify that that's where we start the problem. So in this one, the only number and unit that are given are 5.00 in grams. So this one is easy because there aren't two numbers and I don't have to choose which number I start with. I start with the only number I have, 5.00 grams of copper. All right, so if I start there, what comes next? I draw a blank conversion factor, and if I have grams of copper on top, I have to put grams of copper in the denominator of my conversion factor so that they'll cancel. And then um, here we're trying to get from, uh, gram if I have grams of something, the only place that I can go next is moles. So this question is asking, how many copper atoms are there? Well, I don't know how many grams one atom of copper weighs, because I didn't do that math. Remember, one AMU does not equal one gram. So it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. So I don't know how many grams an atom weighs, but I do know how many grams a mole weighs, because that's the number that's on the periodic table. So it's easy to get from grams to moles, and it's easy to get from moles to grams that conversion factor is this number on the periodic table. Whatever the, the mass is on the periodic table, that tells me how to get from grams to moles and moles to grams for that substance. So here's copper. We find copper on the periodic table. Its number, the atomic mass, is 63.55. So that number, 63.55, is grams per mole. So if I have 5 grams of copper and I have to put grams on the bottom so that they cancel, then it's 63.55 grams per 1 mole, according to the number on the periodic table. All right, so we've done that. That's what we did in the last, the last two examples. Now we're going to take it one step further. How many atoms do I have? Well, if we go back... here. I was counting how many atoms of K I had, but I didn't actually solve for atoms. I just solved for moles. I have 4.7 grams of potassium. The periodic table says that there's 39.10 grams per mole. 4.7 divided by 39.1 is 0.12 moles of potassium. So how many potassium atoms do I have? 0.12 moles.
That's like saying, how many donuts do I have? One dozen. Well, that didn't really tell me how many donuts I have. What if I don't know what a dozen means? Or what if I said, I have 0.37 dozen. I don't really know what 0.37 times 12 is in my head, so that doesn't really tell me how many donuts I have. So 0.12 moles of K doesn't really tell me how many atoms of potassium I have. I have to go one step further. I know that in one mole, I have this number, which is Avogadro's number. One mole of copper is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of copper. One mole is always this number. So if I just do this, this first conversion, then I'll get from 5 grams of copper, and it will tell me how many moles of copper I have. But then I haven't really answered the question, how many atoms do I have? Because I might know that there's 12 in a dozen, but I, I need to go the one step further and actually then multiply it by 12. So if I know how many moles I have, then I put moles on top, and I put moles on the bottom, so moles and moles will cancel. And, how, and then if I have moles down here and I'm trying to get to atoms, then I have to put in the number how many atoms are in one mole. And so I'll fill in Avogadro's number up top. Always before, before you start putting numbers into your calculator, you check to make sure you've set up your conversion right by making sure that your units have canceled. If you started with grams in the numerator, you have to have grams in the denominator somewhere. And then, if that forced you to put moles in the numerator because it's grams per mole, then you have to put moles in the denominator somewhere else so that moles in the numerator and moles in the denominator will cancel. Um, and whatever did not cancel, I only atoms only appears once in my calculation. If atoms didn't get canceled, then atoms becomes my new unit. So I'll take 5 times 1 divided by 63.55 times 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd divided by 1 equals this many copper atoms. So if I have one mole of copper atoms, I have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. One mole weighs 63.55 grams. Do I have one mole? No. I have less than 63.55 grams. So I don't have one mole of copper atoms. So how many atoms do I have? Times 10 to the 22nd, which is a smaller exponent than times 10 to the 23rd, so I have fewer atoms than one mole. So after you do your math, it's important to check the number you got to see if it makes sense. I have less than one mole, because one mole weighs 63.55 according to the periodic table, so I should have fewer atoms than one mole of atoms, and I do. So this, this number makes sense. Copper wire is composed of many, many atoms of copper. Again, we talked about how small they are and how many atoms there are. It's truly a gigantic number. All right, so why don't you pause the video here for a minute and give this one a shot. Okay, our body synthesized protein from amino acids. One of these amino acids is glycine, which has the molecular formula C2H5O2N. How many moles of glycine molecules are contained in 28.35 grams of glycine? So when we think about this one, let's think about what they're asking. How many moles of glycine molecules? So we're trying to get to moles. So it's important when we're trying to turn one of these word problems into a math problem, um, it's important to kind of draw yourself a map. So what I do is I say, okay, this, the question says, how many moles? So it's asking me to get to moles. So I'm going to draw an arrow and say moles. That's what I'm trying to get to. All right, what am I starting with? How many moles of glycine molecules are contained in 28.35 grams? So what I'm starting with is 28.35 grams, and I'm trying to get to moles. Now, to get to gra from grams to moles and moles to grams, what do I need? I need the number on the periodic table. 
right? Well, I have glycine here, and I bring up my periodic table. And, uh, oh yeah, there's no entry for glycine, because glycine has lots of elements in it. And the periodic table just tells me how much one element weighs. It doesn't tell me how much a molecule weighs. So how do I figure this out? How do I figure out what is the molar mass of a compound? Well, we, we worked on formula mass and molecular mass earlier. I know how much one molecule weighs. I do that by adding up the um, mass of each atom that's in the formula. Well, by the same magic of Avogadro's number, one molecule weighs that number in AMU, and one mole of that molecule is, has the same number, but now the units are grams. So we have to calculate the molecular mass of this molecule of glycine. So how do we do that? Well, we take carbon, and it has, uh, I have two of them, and they weigh 12.01 grams per mole. Um, I have, what's the next one? C2H5O2N. Okay, so next is H, 5, 1.0. 1 grams per mole. And these are numbers that I get from the periodic table. I just happen to have the, those memorized. Carbon, 12.01. I got that from the periodic table. Hydrogen, 1.01. .01. All right, next is oxygen, and I have two. And the periodic table says oxygen, 15.999. So if I'm going to round to the two sig figs I have here, then I'd round oxygen to 16.00. And depending on the periodic table that you're using, that's okay. 16.00 and 15.999 are pretty close to each other. So it's okay to use 16.00. It's okay to round to two significant figures when we're doing mass. Nitrogen, I have one, and that weighs 14. Zero, one. Okay, so we um, do the math here. 2 times the number of atoms I have times their molar mass. So I get 24.02, 5.04, Thirty-two point zero zero, fourteen point oh one. We add these together. Fourteen plus thirty-two plus five point oh five plus seventy-five point oh eight grams per mole for the compound C two H five O two N. Right. We just add up. The mass of each atom from the periodic table, and we generate this number, the molar mass, how 75.08 grams per mole. So here we go, 2 times 12, the same thing we just did. They came up with a slightly lower number because they didn't round on two of these like we did. But now, if we know how many grams we start with, 28.35 grams, that's the number I started with according to my, uh, my problem here, 28.35 grams. Then I draw my blank conversion factor, and I put grams in the bottom. And this is asking how many moles. So I'm going to put moles on the top, and now I have to fill in the numbers. Well, I just calculated this, 75.08 in one mole. 
The number of grams that I calculate according to the periodic table, in this case 75.08, it's always the number of grams in one mole. It's always one mole. So um, when we fill in these numbers, that's the last step when you do a conversion here, is filling in the numbers in your conversion factor. Always remember that the number associated with mole is 1. So we get 28.35 divided by 75.08 equals 0 0.377597. And my units, grams and grams cancel. So my units are mole. And now I look over here, I have four sig figs in my measurement. So I should keep four sig figs from my, me from my answer. The 9 is bigger than 5, so I round up. So this equals 0 0.3776 moles. So they rounded to three sig figs, but we're better at sig figs than they are. So we know that if we have four significant figures in our measurement over here, and we're allowed to keep four significant figures in our result over here. So I should round to four sig figs, not three. All right, here's another example. Vitamin C is a covalent compound with the molecular formula C6H8O6. The recommended daily dietary allowance of vitamin C for children aged 4 to 8 years is 1.42 times 10 to the negative 4 moles. What is the mass of this allowance in grams? The molar mass for this compound is computed to be 176.124 grams per mole. So, I have two numbers that I'm given in this one. So I have two numbers that I'm given in this one. So here's one number, and here's another number. I suppose this is a, num a number aged four to eight years. But when we're reading this, and we're trying to turn this into a math problem to figure out what is the mass, that's what it's asking us, what is the mass in grams, then I would have to look at this information and say, okay, well, the dietary allowance of vitamin C for children aged four to eight years, well, the aged four to eight is not important for me calculating this number in grams. So I don't need this information, four to eight. That's irrelevant. So try to find the relevant information in the problem that you're being asked. These word problems are difficult. If I just asked you to do some math, it would be pretty easy. If I just said, do 1.42 divided by 176, or times 176, you could do the math easy. But setting it up to figure out, if I am trying to convert this number to this number, you have to figure out if you're multiplying or dividing. So um, finding the relevant information in the problem is a really good first step. So here are the two numbers that I'm given. Which number do I start with? Well, one number gives me a value, 1.42 times 10 to the negative 4 moles with one unit. And the other number is a value, 176.124. And the unit has uh, two units, grams per mole, one unit over another unit. So whenever you're trying to start a conversion problem like this, you should always start from the number that has just one unit. The other number that has two units, one unit over another, grams per mole in this case, that's actually a conversion factor. Whenever, my, whenever there's a number that has two units, that allows me to convert from one of those units into another unit if I have a measurement 
in one of those other units. So it's important to look at these two numbers and be able to tell the difference between the one that only has one unit, moles, and the number that has two units, grams per mole. And we're always going to put the number that we're given, the one that we start with in the numerator, is always the one with one unit. So in this case, 1.42 times 10 to the negative 4 moles of vitamin C. That's going to go in the numerator. So if that goes in the numerator, I have to put mole of vitamin C in the denominator. And if I'm trying to convert to grams, then if I put moles in the denominator, I should put grams in the numerator. And then um, if we weren't given the molar mass here of vitamin C, but we were given the formula, C6H8O6, then I could do what I just did on the last one. Multipl multiply the mass of carbon by 6, add that to um, the mass of hydrogen times 8, and add that to the mass of oxygen times 6. And I would generate this same number, 176.124. So remember, you multiply by what's on top, 1.42 times 10 to the negative 4 times 176.124, and divide by what's on bottom, divided by 1. So then I would get this number. This is the mass of vitamin C in grams. A packet of an artificial sweetener contains 40 milligrams of saccharin. Here's the chemical formula, which has the structural formula, and it looks like this. So we are, we're given a chemical formula that tells us how many atoms of each element, and we're given a structural formula that shows us the shape of this molecule. So whenever we have a molecule, and remember we can tell a, a molecular compound or a covalent compound because uh, versus an ionic compound because a covalent compound is composed of nonmetals. Look at this one. Carbon, nonmetal. Hydrogen, nonmetal. Nitrogen, nonmetal. Oxygen, nonmetal. Sulfur, nonmetal. These are all nonmetals. And so when, all, when a bunch of nonmetals get together and stick together, they make molecules. And molecules have shapes like this. They're not ionic. Ionic compounds don't really have shapes. Ionic compounds um, have repeating patterns, have grids, and the grids, the cubes just repeat over and over and over again. But molecules have shapes. Given that saccharin has a molar mass of 183.18 grams per mole, how many saccharin molecules are in a 40 milligram sample of saccharin? How many carbon atoms are in the same sample? All right, so here's an opportunity for us to practice without seeing a solution right away. So, what is the first step? You should make a solution map. We should identify what we're trying to solve for. So this says, given that saccharin has a molar mass of this number, how, oops, how many saccharin molecules and how many carbon atoms? Okay, so I'm trying to get to saccharin, I'm just going to abbreviate S-A-C-C, -C, saccharin molecules, it's asking me how many, and it also wants to know how many carbon atoms. So I'm, tr I'm going to get two different answers here. My units will be saccharin molecules for one number and carbon atoms for the other number. So where am I starting? Well, I have two other numbers here. This one. And this one. So where, which one do I start with? I should start with the one that has one unit, 40 milligrams. So I'm starting from milligrams. Milligrams of, well, let me take a step back here. Since we're dealing with two different substances, we're dealing with um, saccharin and carbon, I want to specify milligrams of what? So I'm starting with milligrams of saccharin. 
So I'm trying to get from milligrams of saccharin to saccharin molecules. And I'm trying to get from milligrams of saccharin to carbon atoms. We start with 40 milligrams of saccharin. 40.0, I think it says. 40.0. It's important to include that 0, 0.0 because that's going to help us assess how many sig figs we get to keep at the end of the problem. 40 milligrams saccharin. Okay, so milligrams in the top milligrams in the bottom. So I know that in order to get to a number of molecules or a number of atoms, I'm trying to count something, that I need to use mole because mole is how I count atoms and molecules because they're so big and there's so many of them I need to use a number like uh, units like moles because that will make a big number smaller. So when I'm thinking about well I can how do I get to moles well, the periodic table gives me a number, and that number is grams per mole. So if I'm given a mass in grams, I can convert a mass in grams into moles. But I'm not given a mass in grams here. I'm given a mass in milligrams. So if I don't have grams, then I cannot get to moles first. So if I'm given a mass in milligrams, the first thing I have to do, so let me take a step back here on my solution, I'm going to start with milligrams, and I first have to convert to grams. And then once I have grams, I can convert to the number of molecules. So how do I get from milligrams to grams? Well, I have to use the metric system. And if I look up the metric system and I look up the prefix milli, little m equals 10 to the minus 3. So mg equals 10 to the minus 3g. I put that number, that prefix multiplier, 10 to the minus 3. It's always associated with the base unit. So not, it's not associated with milligrams because milligrams already has a prefix, m. So I put the 10 to the minus 3 in front of the g. It doesn't have a prefix. It's just g all by itself. It's always where the number goes. All right, so now I have grams. In one milligram, I have 10 to the minus 3 grams. Now I'll put another conversion factor in. And now if I have grams in the numerator, I have to put grams in the denominator so that they'll cancel. OK, so now if I have grams of saccharin, now I can get to moles. Let me write that in here. Grams of saccharin. I'm trying to get to moles of saccharin. Remember, saccharin is just the name of a molecule. So this number is, is given 183.18 grams per mole. Here's the molecule of saccharin. I'm trying to figure out how many of these molecules do I have. Well, it's 183. I already forgot what it said. 183.18. One eighty three point one eight grams of saccharin in every one mole of saccharin. So after I do this calculation, grams of saccharin, oh excuse me, this is milligrams and milligrams cancel. Grams and grams cancel. So this would tell me how many moles of saccharin I have. So remember, a mole is not telling me how many things I have. You have 0.8 dozen donuts. Well, 0.8 dozen doesn't tell me how many donuts I have. Is that enough or not? I would have to do some math and say 0.8 times 12. 
So telling me how many moles of saccharin molecules I have doesn't really tell me how many saccharin molecules I have. I have to go one step further and say, well, how many, how many molecules are in a mole? So how many molecules are in a mole? If I have a mole on top in the numerator, then I have to put mole in the denominator in my next conversion factor because I need mole and mole to cancel. And after mole and mole cancel, I'm trying to get from mole to molecules. So in one mole, how many molecules do we have? Well, in one mole of anything, I have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. 10 to the 23rd. So, if we follow back this conversion, I start with milligrams. I've got to augment my map here because my map changed a little bit. So I started at milligrams, and then I go to grams, and then from grams I go to moles, and then from moles I go to molecules. So how do I get from milligrams to grams or from any prefix to anything without a prefix or to even do a different prefix? I use the metric system. I have to use those metric prefixes. Um, the milli and... So I have to use those metric prefixes. Milli and kilo and centi. Um, and those prefixes will help me get in, will help me convert between units in the metric system. Okay, so once I'm in grams, how do I get from grams to moles? So to get from grams to moles or moles to grams, you always use the molar mass. So the molar mass is always the conversion factor that will get you in between grams and moles because what are the units of molar mass? grams per mole. So using the molar mass I can convert between grams and moles. Okay so then once I'm in moles how do I get from moles to molecules? I've calculated the number of moles I have but it asks me how many molecules of saccharin. So to get from moles to molecules I have to use Avogadro's number. And Avogadro's number is 10, uh, or excuse me, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Avogadro's number. All right, so this is what my map looks like so far. Milligrams to grams using the metric system. Grams to moles using the molar mass of saccharin. Moles to molecules using Avogadro's number. So now we can, let's calculate this. 40 times 10 to the negative third divided by 1 times 1. Remember, you don't have to divide and multiply by 1, obviously. I'm just emphasizing that you multiply by what's on top and you divide by what's on bottom. Divided by 183.18 times 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. So how many molecules do I have? Oops, that's not what I meant. I have 1.31 times 10 to the 20 saccharin molecules. So this number, 1.31 times 10 to the 20, is this bigger or smaller than one mole? It's smaller, right? Because one mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. So I have less than one mole of molecules. Does that make sense? How much would one mole of saccharin molecules weigh? 
Well, according to this number, one mole of saccharin molecules would weigh 183.18 grams. Do I have 183.18 grams? No, I don't even have one gram. I have 40 milligrams. So um, the number that I generated is reasonable with what I started with. I have less than one mole times 10 to the 20. I had less than 183 grams. I only had 43 milligrams. So those numbers are consistent. So it's always just a good idea to go back and look at the number that you calculated and see if it makes sense. Try to make sense of the calculation you just did. Okay, so we've, we've answered half the question. We know how many saccharin molecules we have. So let's start here. 1.31 times 10 to the 20 saccharin molecules. But this question now asks one more. It asks us to go further. How many carbon atoms are in the same sample? So we just calculated how many of these we have. This is a saccharin molecule. I have 1.31 times 10 to the 20 saccharin molecules. Of, so I have, let's uh, say, 1.31 trillion, 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 something like that of these. So how many carbon atoms do I have? Do I have more carbon atoms than that number, 1.31 times 10 to the 20? Or do I have fewer carbon atoms than that number? Just think about it. If I have one of these, how many carbon atoms do I have? Well, if I have one of these, I have seven carbon atoms. So if I have one mole of these, how many carbon atoms do I have? Seven moles. Seven times however many molecules there are, because there's always one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbon atoms in a molecule. So when I'm trying to figure out, I have this many molecules, how many carbon atoms do I have? Well, I just need a conversion factor. In every one saccharin molecule, there are seven carbon atoms. Because remember, saccharin looks like this. C7. Let's get this thing. H5NO3S. H5NO3S. So in every one of these, I have seven Cs. Well, that's just what the formula is telling me, C7. So... How many carbon atoms do I have? I have that number times 7. 9.2 times, there, let me add some more sig figs just so we can, 9.20494 times 10 to the 20 carbon because now saccharin molecule and saccharin molecule cancels out. So now my units are carbon atoms. And now, up here I had three sig figs. So I generated a number here that had three sig figs. So I can only keep three sig figs in my answer. So I look to the four, which tells me that I round down. 9.20 times 10 to the 20th carbon atoms. Okay, 